Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Thursday presentation. The artist, the censor, and the nude. We will be starting in about 10 minutes. If you have a seat inside, please find your way to the Shermer Meeting Hall. Thank you.
Hello everyone, welcome again to the Thursday presentation. The artist, the censor, and the nude will begin in just a minute or two. If you have a seat or would like a seat in the house, please make your way to the Shermer Meeting Hall. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome again. Our program will begin very soon. <laughs> Please take your seats, thank you.
Good. Welcome. And good evening. I'm Nancy Wilhelms, and I'm the executive director of Anderson Ranch. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program. Uh, it's in conjunction with the book release of The Artist, The Censor, and the Nude, A Tale of Morality and Appropriation. And it's by Glenn Harcourt, featuring artwork by artist and ranch friend Pamela Joseph, and a foreword by Francis Nauman. Uh, all three of them are here tonight. Um, before we begin, please note that the opinions expressed in the program are those of the participating individuals. <laughs> all right? So I, wanna, I want you to know we were all together for lunch and it was a rocking conversation. <laughs> all right? Uh, and we welcome you to join the conversation. So in just a moment, I'm going to bring up our moderator, Eleanor Hartney, who's at the end here. Um, and she's going to introduce our panelists, but I want to tell you a little bit about Eleanor. Eleanor has a history with the ranch. She's been here several times as a panelist uh, and a sy symposium participant. She is a very well-known writer uh, on the topic of the contemporary visual arts. She's a, a contributing editor to Art in America and Art Press. She's written extensively on contemporary art issues for Art News, Art and Auction, the New York Art Examiner, the Washington Post, and the New York Times. Uh, Eleanor is also the author of numerous books on contemporary art, including Art and Today, Postmodernism, and Postmodern Heretics. She's the co-author of After the Revolution, Women Who Transformed Contemporary Art, Yahoo, mm -hmm. and The Reckoning, Women Artists in the New Millennium. Please welcome Eleanor Hartney. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm just going to sit, stay here, sit here rather than go to the podium. Um, you, uh, you have a program um, that gives you kind of detailed biographical information on the panelists. So um, rather than kind of reiterate all of that, what I just want to um, kind of introduce each of them and kind of what their function is in relationship to this panel. Um, first of all, of course, I think Pam Joseph needs no introduction to all of you. Um, and the, her, it was her work that was the inspiration for the book and the ideas that we're going to be talking about today. So, um, in fact, she's going to give us a little kind of um, rundown on some of the images and some of the um, ideas in the book, which will give us sort of a basis for further discussion. Um, Glenn Harcourt is an independent scholar um, and has a background actually in, I think you were saying in um, 17th century... Uh, I, I have a PhD in 17th century the, Dutch painting. Right. Secondly, so, <laughs> it, it was just a natural thing, of course, then to, you know, bring him into this project. Um, but no, has, has written a very, um, I think, provocative and, and complex... Uh, meditation, um, starting from the work of, of, the, of Pam's and then sort of spiraling it outward uh, to talk about much larger issues about um, censorship, uh, cultural difference, etc. And we'll be talking about that um, in this panel. And then finally, uh, Francis Nauman is a renowned uh, scholar and dealer. Uh, his, his specialty is Duchamp and Dada, and he has um, contributed the introduction to the book. And I think we'll also be very helpful in this panel in giving us some um, kind of historical grounding for the whole notion of censorship. So without further ado, um, because we have a lot of ground to cover, I'm going to turn it over to Pam, who is going to give you just a little kind of summary of, uh, a, a, really a kind of flavor of what's going on in the book. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming, and especially all my fellow panel members. It's the first time Francis and Glenn have ever been to Aspen, and Eleanor was here a few years ago. So it's great to have her back. Um, I'm going to, um, Sean, maybe, uh, Give me the first slide. I think I'm just going to stand. I feel more comfortable, I think, standing. Um, I just want to give you a little background on how the, um, the book evolved. Um, the, uh, in, in 2012, um, our very good friend, I feel like the better city, because the letter was <laughs> um, in 2012, our very, very good friend, Karash Vala Najed, 
um, received these pirated books from Iran and um, knew my work very well and thought that I would be able to use them. Karash is Persian. He's from Iran. His family had to leave there when the Shah was overthrown. And um, he sent these books to me, and they're, they were just so powerful and amazing. I knew I, the, the books, had, they were censored. If the book was printed outside of the, um, I'll just show you some, I'm going to start showing you some of these books. If the books were printed outside of Iran, they had actually hired peasants, or perhaps prisoners, we're still not really sure, to go in individually into each art book, that eyewitness companion in the center, and go in and censor any nudity in works of art by famous painters, artists like Matisse, um, Duchamp, Hockney, Picasso. Um, and then on the right and left, you'll see the book on Dada and Cubism. Those books were actually printed in Iran and if the books were printed in Iran, then the censorship was actually done in the printing. So they would either pixelate the, the nudity or they would black it out in the printing. Um, I just didn't know what to do with the books at first. I mean, Koresh was right. This is sort of really up my alley. My work is about uh, socio sociopolitical issues, uh, feminist critique. Um, and also I had just finished uh, working on a series for four years that where I used um, famous artists' works, such as Hokusai or Picasso and Matisse. And, um, but in these works, I was interjecting body parts from Mexican porn comic books. And it was my way of maybe invading, vandalizing these male artists' works and, and making a feminist statement. Let me just go back and miss that one. So Magritte. And it was a big series. I mean, I worked on it for four years. And I did a number of paintings about Rousseau. And um, so that was, you know, was in my ballpark. And the other thing that really attracted the work to me was the absurdity of it all. I mean, how can you censor all? And people, art, artists, scholars, teachers in Iran are going to be working from these books. And here they're all censored. They can't see any of the works of art. And on the other hand, I mean, with the internet, it's, images are readily available. So it just, I, I, so it's part of my idea of, working, of works that have censorship, but humor involved and absurdity. So I decided to take on the project. Um, so this was 2012. But I decided when I took it on that the only way I could do it to, was to report it as, exactly as I saw it. So to have everything, I had to be technically proficient, technically perfect in the paintings, and I had to um, approach the whole issues with um, ethical and spiritual and moral concerns and empathy for these works of art. So the first one I tackled was the Angra, um, of all ones, it's probably the most difficult. He's such an amazing artist, and um, I painted as perfectly as I possibly could. The uh, censored image is on the left there. The, my painting is on the right. I didn't realize that it was going to be so traumatic for me. I painted the painting, like I said, perfectly as I could. And then it came time for me to um, obscure my own work. And it was um, Robert, my partner, Robert Brinker, real, really was like my coach. And I did two studies for it. And we sort of practiced. And I finally did the, the real painting. But I, I felt uh, physically um, nauseous, you know, having to violate such a beautiful work of art. And I'm going to go through just a few of these to give you an idea of the censorship in the books and then my work after. I thought this one was amazing. This is um, Tea Time by John Metzinger, where the censor actually took the time to pixelate around the spoon. I mean, it, it, it's very irregular, the censorship. I mean, some is so sloppily done. And then others, um, you know, they've taken the time to, to do that. And that's my painting. And this one was, was interesting to me because um, Le Demoiselles is such a, a strong painting, but the fact that they um, put the black marks, the blacked out areas into the cubist forms, it just almost accentuates the, the strength of the painting. And then that's my painting. And I did a number of different ones that I said, but I, I wanted to show this slide just because if I take off my glasses or you blur your eyes, mm -hmm. even though it's pixelated, it, it's, you can really see the 
you know, genital areas of breasts, it, it's almost more uh, enticing and alluring than if, if they hadn't censored it. And men were censored also. I just want to make sure everyone knows that. These are the three fabulous sculptures in Florence, Neptune, David, and Zeus. And they're my three gods. <laughs> And of course, this was the height of absurdity, right? <laughs> we all know what a urinal looks like. And why they had to censor the urinal and pixelate it is, you know, it just was, was totally beyond me. But then once I did the painting, um, I got fascinated by, by it. I actually did, this is about 54 inches. I did two smaller studies. And it became to me a, an exercise in doing like an Albers painting where you'd have one square next to another and one square affects the other. So you're mixing it up on your palette and then you go to put the uh, paint on the canvas and it totally ch changes it. And I also just love the, the fact that you have this abstraction and geometric piece above, and then you have the free-flowing lines of the, of the fountain down below. We, finally, I started getting really upset and just feeling I was part of the censorship and I, I really didn't, I didn't want to do it anymore, but I knew I had to continue. This is the um, censored Matisse large reclining nude in the book. So when I went to do this one, I was like, okay, I just won't make my paint as black. You know, you'll start be, be able to see through it, you know? And I became a little more subversive. You could, you could start seeing the form. You could start seeing the bodies. Same thing with the shod. You know, I, instead of uh, obliterating it all, you know, it becomes a little transparent. So you can see the hairs, you can see the nipples, you can see the form better. And this one, of course, is so ridiculous, you know, that they would have just desecrated her the poor Olympia so badly. And I, why they left the foot exposed on the upper section, I'm not sure. And then down below in the lower right, you can see they've totally covered over uh, where her ankle was. And at this, at, by this point, I was, just getting, I was just getting angry. And I just really didn't want to paint this painting anymore. So this is my version of it. <laughs> I just took out all my anger on, on poor Olympia you know, and scribbled across it. Um, but, I, but I do love the fact that she's still looking out at you as, as if to say, um, I have survived. And then in 2015, I had a show at Francis Sim Nauman, Nauman Fine Arts of the Censored series. And at the same time, um, Picasso's um, Les Femmes d'Algerie was sold at Christie's for I think 179 million. And Fox 5 News had this on their channel and of course they had to blur out any offending nudity. <laughs> now it's totally abstract, obviously, you know, but why they went and did this, and it just, the, the whole series just came full cycle for me when I saw that we had censorship here in America. And you'll see that in the middle, for some reason, they did not um, obscure the, the buttocks. <laughs> <laughs> And Stephen Colbert had a field day discussing it. Yeah. And just to, to let you know that we're not the only country that also censors. This was in Italy when um, the president, uh, Rouhani of Iran, visited there. They boxed up all the nude sculptures so he would not be offended. And then I ended up doing a few more just because by that time I was starting to have fun again. And I had to do the, uh, did two different ones of nude descending the staircase. Francis always said that was so scandalized and censored because the nude was actually upright rather than reclining. And so finally, um, to get to the, the publication of the book, I had met Carrie Patterson actually uh, here at Anderson Ranch many years ago in a Photoshop class. And Carrie has always been a wonderful supporter of my work and thought that this body of work would make for an excellent essay. So she contacted um, Glenn Harcourt, amazing scholar, uh, academician, and writer. And Glenn took on the job. He was supposed to just do a very short essay. But then he got so involved, he started researching Iranian artists. So the first part of the book is on my work. The second part of the work, book is on contemporary Iranian artists, which I think really broadens the scope of the, of the project. And then uh, Francis, by the way, as Eleanor said, wrote the foreword. And then the third section of the book um, actually shows more images from the censored books so that um, the viewer, the reader, can experience the censorship um, themselves. And um, 
There's also an afterword I wrote that describes my feelings uh, toward the whole project. So that just gives you a, a short update okay. on my work and my involvement. But um, I think we have a really hot topic. I'm very excited yep. about the panel. And All right. so turning it over to my friends. Great, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and as Pam says, one of the things that's very intriguing about this, both the project, uh, the, her series of paintings, and then the book that resulted from it, is that it kind of complicates a lot of our assumptions about cultural difference, censorship, um, you know, kind of how art, religion, and politics intersect. And I think that, you know, I, I, when Pam, Pam's talked about how when she first got the books, um, these censored Iranian books, and, you know, and I think for any of us that when you first see them and you kind of, it, there's almost like a, a little bit of a sense of superiority that, you know, okay, here we are, you know, with, you know and, and in our open culture, of course, we can look at all of these images, but in Iran, you know, this is not possible, and these, you know, you know great masterpieces of Western art have to be censored, and it's, you know, it, it, it gives us sort of this sense that, you know, we are kind of more forward thinking. But what I think Pam has indicated, and what is also, um, I think, something that you talk about a lot in the book, you know, is that it, it's a lot more complex than that. And one of the things that the, I think this project in the book allows us to do is to sort of question some of our own assumptions, not only about other cultures, but about our own culture. Mm -hmm. So the first question that I want to address to the panel, and this is addressed to you, Glenn, um, it goes back to this um, women of Algiers um, being censored by uh, Fox News at the behest of the FCC. And how is that substantially different or the same as the kind of censorship that goes on, um, you know, the, the, the censoring of body parts of uh, Western paintings in these textbooks? Well, in, in some ways, it's not very different. Um, and in, in fact, the people at Fox News, it's a little bit difficult to know exactly why they did what they did. There's two possible reasons. One of them is because they made an editorial decision that was confined to the people who were putting the broadcast together. And the other one is that they were trying to shortstop the possibility of people in their audience, in their target audience, complaining to the FCC um, that they were seeing inappropriate material on television because the FCC does have rules Right? How many people here have seen the great, was that George Carlin? The things you can't say oh, on right. radio? Shoot. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, there, there still are, despite that uh, wonderful comedy routine, there still are things that you can't show on television or that you have to show after particular times in the evening when it's deep that most kids will be in bed. None of this, of course, applies to cable which is not controlled by the FCC, which is why Game of Thrones gets to get away with what they get away with. Um, but um, the FCC was essentially probably just watching out for, they were covering themselves so that they would not get complaints, blowback, from the people who were, um, who were actually watching the show. In Iran, I think it's much more likely that um, there is a greater sense of top-down um, pressure on cultural producers to take the kind of decisions that result in the censorship of their own work. Um, although, um, as is often the case in cultures which are very bureaucratic, and Iran is very bureaucratic, there's always room in any individual case for push and pull. Um, mm. And in fact, we can cite some examples of times when movie audiences, that in this case, in Iran, behaved very much like the viewers of Fox News might have behaved in New York. Mm -hmm. um, there were a couple of films um, 
that had been passed by the Iranian censors. They were released to theaters. People went to see them. They thought that the filmmakers were pushing the bounds um, of propriety beyond where they should have gone. And they complained to the Ministry of Culture. And the films were eventually, I guess, pulled from the market. So there's not, there's not actually all that much difference necessarily, well, at well, least yeah. in this case. Well, and, and I think this is interesting that sort of where, it, where does the censorship come from, you know, and, you know, again, we sort of make assumptions we, that, okay, here, you know, this is Big Brother, you know, shutting everything down. But one of the things um, that I wanted to ask you, Pam, is that, you know, that it, it's very interesting, you know, this work comes out of a long time preoccupation that you have with the kind of representations of the female body in art and in popular culture and, you know, appropriating um, images from not only from old master paintings, but as you say, from, you know, pornographic imagery, putting them together in these kind of very, witty and humorous ways, and doing it from a feminist perspective, because, you know, one of the, um, it, it's interesting that even within feminism, you know, there has been a kind of battle about censorship in the sense that, that there are, is, is sort of a faction um, who, you know, looks at the tradition of the nude in um, uh, historic Western art and sees this as the objectification of women and feels that, you know, that we might call it the sort of position of feminist iconoclasm, you know, feels that, that these images should not be seen. Mm -hmm. You're, you take, obviously, a very different point of view mm -hmm. about that. Um, and in fact, you know, you very playfully deal with these images. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, the sort of the feminist kind of side of, of, it, of this notion of censorship, or censorship maybe kind of even within feminism. Well, I can go back probably t to my past, and I discuss this a little bit in the afterward that when I was growing up, um, you know, women's positions were obviously just very low in esteem. And when the feminist movement started, I really wasn't a part of it. Um, I, I was always a very strong feminist in my own right. I mean, I had a very strong matriarchal family. My mother and my grandmother told me I could do anything a man could do, only better. You know, so I, you try to do that. But I couldn't really identify with the women's movement because it wasn't... Um, for all women. It wasn't necessarily for gays or blacks or, um, it was for a certain, or in my perception of it, it was for a certain elite group of, of, of women. And um, so I took a different t attack on it and tried to express it through my work. Because I really truly believe if a woman has uh, full control over her body, she can expose it if she wants or she can uh, have it covered. Like the, the ban recently um, on the beaches in, in France where the burkas were actually, um, there was an order to have the women take, take these off. Right. You know, and they have a right to cover their bodies just as much as we have a right to uncover our bodies. So I mean, I've tried to deal with it, as you say, in sort of a playful, humorous way because I think if you're gonna um, try to make some of these points, you have to do it in a, in a, lighter, uh, in a lighter approach. But um, it's always been a part of my work, and uh, and I have done a lot of appropriation. But I, I, I just feel like it, it is certainly a woman's right, and that's how I've always expressed right. it. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, and it, it, so it's, it's, it's very interesting because your work exists in this sort of tension between, you know, these, these, these two kind of contradictory positions. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to um, bring uh, you in now, Francis, because giving us a little bit of historical perspective here. Because one of the things that I, I is really one of the most striking images in the book, as you said, is Duchamp's urinal and, and the pixelation of Duchamp's urinal. Now, in, in most cases, in the cases um, of the, in the book, the, cen the, the censorship has to do with the human body. It has to do with, you know, um, you know, breasts, or mostly women, but also, you know, kind of male sexual organs. The, the Duchamp image seems like it kind of sits outside of that. And yet, one thing that's kind of striking, you know, the, the other, you also have um, nude descending a, a staircase, which I guess is your image, not from... That is not from the book. Yeah, not from the book. That was one of your later ones. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, is a work which was censored um, when it originally came out. So what is it about Duchamp and the body? I mean, I'm thinking also about kind of his last work, Etan Doné, and I'm, I'm wondering if there's, there, um, you know, is, is something here as well that maybe the response to Duchamp, did it also have to do with this element of the body, or does the body kind of come into this? 
in the beginning, maybe before he made the new descending a staircase, you could make an argument for that uh, because they were all painting nudes and, and that figured into it. But I don't think when it comes to the urinal that was an issue. <clears throat> he just knew how to pick some. You, you see, he had been making ready-mades for years. Uh, and anyone who went to his apartment and saw them would just dismiss them, walk by them. But then he threw a urinal in the face of the public, so they had to confront. Uh, they could have argued that the other things were an art, but now they had, to, had an issue. They had to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And he didn't pick just, you know, he could have picked anything. He could have put a chair in the exhibition. Right. It wouldn't have offended anyone. Right. But, but a urinal was intended to be provocative. And do you and think, though, it, there, but there's a body aspect to the urinal. Just because men urinate in it? Or because it looks it, like well, a Madonna? Both. Because they enter? Nah, that's, no. Uh, nah, I don't think so. No. Uh, I mean, unless I you want to argue that it's a uniquely male device, and then you have to envision <laughs> what goes on in front of that device. And right. I guess that, that could be, that's, mm -hmm. it was offensive then, and to a certain extent, it remains offensive. You know, mm -hmm. that's a uh, I, I always thought that it's a little bit elitist, but one of the things I love about Duchamp is I feel I understand him, mm -hmm. but I feel I always pick a different state, like let's pick a, the people of Iowa will never understand, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I'm pretty safe with that, uh, they, right. because they're going to argue, <laughs> not, not about the offensiveness of the object, but that it's a work of art. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it was, so it wasn't. It was the, a different kind of. For the issue. nude, it's different. The nude was really intended. Uh, you know, the idea of a nude going downstairs was the. See, when it was shown in France, it was shown. He submitted it to an exhibition, and his brothers interceded. And Glaze and Metzanger, two painters, interceded to have it withdrawn from the exhibition. But it was more for formal reasons because it looked. It looked like futurist paintings, and they mm -hmm. were involved with Cubism. They didn't want their movement confused mm -hmm. with the other one. But when it came to America, it was a very different mm -hmm. scene. Uh, it came to the Armory Show in 1913, and it was unbelievable, uh, the attacks against that one particular picture. But no one came right out and said what the problem was. They said, it's called Nude Descending a Staircase, because the words are right there in French at the bottom, mm -hmm. and it's Nude Descendant an Escalier. You can don't need to speak mm -hmm. much French to figure it out. So they found it offensive that a woman would be walking downstairs. That's, that is, has to be the, because hmm. I, I always ask the same question. A, a nude in art history can always lay down, eat grapes. She's on Mount Olympus, but there are no <laughs> stairs on Mount Olympus. And if a nude is walking down the stairs, you have to ask yourself when you last saw a nude, walking mm -hmm. downstairs. When I last I, I said this, someone raised their hand and said, my wife this morning, the, you know, that, that, <laughs> um, but it's, it's a bordello scene, mm -hmm. usually. So that, mm -hmm. that was too much for the American public to absorb. And in fact, in a lot of bordello scenes, if you think of the pictures of women that they post, that, that are placed above bars mm -hmm. in bordellos, they're all rip-offs from Titian. Yeah, reclining. Mm. They're all reclining because they have to mm. fit yeah, into well, that right. space. Sure. Well, they, could, they have to come down the stairs first, then you pick them, then you recline. Right, right. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, right. I was actually, I was just wondering, because we've talked both about the new descending staircase and about the, um, and um, about the Olympia, um, it seems to me, just thinking back on what I have seen in, in various places, that those two works were probably the most savaged in caricature of mm -hmm. any works that I can think of. I can think of lots and lots of caricatures that appeared in the popular press, in newspapers and so on, mm -hmm. of the Duchamp mm -hmm. and also of the Olympia. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think in, in one sense that um, is a testimony to the importance of those two works in, in, the, in the cultural history of the time in which they were made, mm. that they were that, that they were that mm. Mm. Right. provocative, oh, provocative yeah. yeah. Well, and I, and I wanna now kind of jump ahead in time a bit, um, you know, sort of s jumping through censorship through the ages. Um, and, and because one of the other kind of issues that's I think really brought up in a, a kind of very potent way in this book is the, 
is the role of kind of religion and censorship and politics and how, so certainly in the case of the Iranian work, um, you know, that these are, it's a theocracy, so these things are totally entwined. But again, you know, the book kind of gives us a, a way of looking at ourselves and, you know, kind of seeing that how these issues maybe have also played out you know, in our culture. And one of the things that struck me, of course, was, um, you know, this, this, this issue of religion was something that was so central to the culture wars of the 90s, you know, 30 years ago. You know, we also, you know, had a, a government that seemed to be very much um, opposed to art in the sense that, you know, you had congressmen who were sort of ripping up paintings or, or, or catalogs of paintings, um, shows. Um, they were, um, you know, they, they were taking, um, uh, you know, money away from the, the these the condemning these artists, um, you know, that there was the whole thing with Serrano and Maplethorpe. They were even, yeah, there was even a, a case where the uh, director of one of the museums that showed the Maplethorpe show um, was taken to trial for pandering obscenity. So there was, it was a time when um, it, it seemed that, you know, that, it, that Censorship was very much um, kind of uh, uh, the role of the government, and it was often done in the name of religion, in the sense that almost all the artists who were in some way um, condemned, you know, that they were condemned because their work was obscene, because it was sacrilegious or blasphemous. And in fact, um, interestingly, and I, this is something I ended up writing a book about, it, it struck me and I realized that um, in almost every case during these controversies, the artists came from Catholic backgrounds. And that there was, I, you know, my theory was that there was something about Catholicism, not, not that they were practicing Catholics, but, but that being raised Catholic gave you a certain sort of relationship to the body, which was then deemed offensive in the larger American culture, which was a more sort of Protestantly oriented culture. So it was a, it was a time when, you know, kind of religion, politics, and art were entwined. And, and it was interesting, too, because it, the culture war at that time was very, in certain ways, you know, the, the, the battle lines were very similar to the ones that we have right now. But at that time, art was absolutely at the center of it in a way that art isn't now, um, which is, you know, also kind of an interesting thing to discuss. But what I wanted to uh, ask you, Glenn, was, was to talk a little bit, because this is, as uh, Pam was saying, the second half of the book, you know, deals with the Iranian situation. And there again, you know, you're kind of dealing with this intertwining of uh, politics, you know, religion um, and art, and, and sexuality kind of entering into it as well. And in the second half of the book, you talk about Iranian artists and, and how, and I think they're pretty much all women artists or mostly women artists. The people that I talk about are mainly women, but there are plenty of men who make art in Iran right. today. Right. I, it was easy for things to fall out that way because Pam is a woman, and <laughs> um, we began by thinking about the way in which her work was mm -hmm. used or could function as a feminist critique of the way in which Western men and some women have looked at the nude human body and we got from there to Iran. Um, yeah, I'll be willing. Well, so anyway, I was just, yeah, I, I think that what, what, what's interesting is that um, one of the things that you kind of show uh, is that um, a lot of these artists, in a way, because they're working against these constraints, there are certain kind of very clear constraints about what can be seen, you know, what, what, how the body can be presented, and that actually then begins to give them you know, it gives them something to work against, and it, 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 it is, in a way, um, makes their work possible. Okay, let me, can I yeah. address that? All right, yeah. the first thing I want to do mm -hmm. is to speak for just a moment in defense of the Iranian government, whom mm -hmm. everybody seems to be down on all the time. Um, the strictures that are represented by the censoring of the nude, oh, excuse me, I didn't, didn't no, yeah, do that. Um, by the censoring of the nude human body in works like the one that you see there, have very deep roots in Islamic theology. Roots that are not necessarily 
um, coincident with an ideology of patriarchy, although they might be. And the fact of the matter is that, in, that within Islam, there are tenets that govern what may and what may not be shown of the male body as well. Um, it just so happens that we happen to be more interested in looking at women's bodies um, and, and the strictures are a little bit stiffer with regard <clears throat> to women. But within Islam, both men and women are expected in their daily lives to conform when they're in public to certain um, uh, modes of dress and behavior. And these are very, very deeply rooted in the culture. Um, so it, that's a little bit different from a sort of rogue um, members of Congress from the South saying, well, we can't fund the NEA because there are these guys like Andre Serrano who do artworks that we personally think are not appropriate. But there, um, yeah, but there was, there was a, a kind of larger ideology that it, it wasn't just random, these attacks. I no, mean, I, don't, I, don't think that, I don't think that they yeah. were random either. Um, but what I'm just trying to say is that, is that when you look at Iran, you're not looking at a situation where the government is attacking art in the same way that the government attacked art in the 1980s no, and sure. the 1990s. Sure. The, a, and the government of Iran is not a government that systematically disfavors art. Right? The people who live in Iran have a very deep artistic culture that goes way, way back in time, way prior to the arrival of Islam, and that culture has been nourished through regime change after regime change, and it is still nourished today, although in ways that we don't necessarily respond to all that easily. It's true. People in Iran who go to produce culture, who make images, have to find a way in order to, say, address images of the body, how they can function, how they look, how they can appear in public and private, they have to take account of a lot of bureaucratic rules and theological tenets which we don't care, which we don't have to care about. Well, um, but they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're mostly the, the, the people who, Excuse me, the people who have stayed in Iran, the artists who have stayed in Iran, who are mostly, mostly would consider themselves to be practicing Muslims, even if they don't agree with government policies about a lot of stuff, um, um, are relatively okay about accepting this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, um, because, yeah, as you're saying, I mean, it, it's you sometimes, you know, strictures allow you to explore things in other ways. And, and actually, I wanted to kind of come back to you in terms of that idea, Pam, because, um, you know, it, I mean, you, you talked about how in some of the works, as, as, as you kind of proceeded, you began to realize that by covering up aspects of the body, somehow you make them more you know, available to our imagination. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the same way that I think for artists working against sort of certain kinds of strictures, it allows them to, um, to say things um, and, and to, to put things out there um, and to make suggestions in a maybe a even more effective way. Mm -hmm. So that for you, you know, you talked about how sort of covering, pixelating, etc. But the, the, the body still kind of showed through. And so that it, in a way it almost made it more erotic exactly. um, to cover things and, and, and to kind of 
pixelate them, to, to make, to obscure them. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about, and also your experience of, of, of doing that. And, and as you said, you know, it's, it's, it wasn't, in the beginning you were just obliterating, but then it, it became something else, I think, for you. Yeah, by the end I was actually having fun being, but, but in a more playful way. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's very serious what's going on. I mean, I, I, one of the Iranian artists, just, just to jump around a little bit, I was so impressed he devised a system uh, but he was he was able to take the black markings off of the works of art, so he could start. Oh seeing yeah, we we published it here a right recipe underneath. for mm -hmm. getting magic marker off um, <laughs> printed material, so that you can see the mm -hmm. images that are underneath. But it you know it but there is this temptation you know I mean it's like I said I take my glasses off I, I it blurs you know I mean I, I think it almost becomes more enticing more interesting you know what is was. What is behind this? Or in the, in the Demoiselle, seeing those strong cubist forms, it brings the art for, for, forward more. Um, but in, in a way, it's, it's absurd that they think that they can cover the body, mm -hmm. because the body's there. And, right. and, and then it just sort of, it, you know, it, it's, there's an allure there. You're, you want to know what is underneath it. So mm -hmm. like this artist trying to figure out how to, right. to, to resource. To play that sort of double, yeah. double thing. And I, I think, you know, for me, I, I approach the work totally differently. Um, I mean, I'm not Iranian. I'm a I'm white American woman artist. Um, so I, I didn't even think of the Iranian artist. So when Glenn started discussing that part in the book, it was, it was interesting. I mean, as you said, um, they almost have more to react against. Mm -hmm. You know, they have the government, they have uh, yeah. censorship, they have to be very creative in the ways that they express their work and what they do. They can't just be, they can't just be angry and they can't yep. just push back. Because if they do that, they do get in trouble with mm -hmm. the government. And when you get in trouble with the government, that means going to jail. Mm -hmm. the, there's a story mm. in here about a wonderful movie that I would recommend to everybody out here called Nobody knows anything about Persian cats. It's about two young Iranian kids. They're like 20. They want to go to England and be in an indie rock band. And they have to get papers and money to get out of England. It's based upon a true story. And one of the things that comes out during the course of the, during the, course of the, um, during the, course of the unfolding of the film is that both of them have spent time in prison. Okay, how many people here had spent time in prison by the mm -hmm. time you were 17, eight year, 18 years old, not for punching somebody, not for robbing a 7-Eleven, but, but for playing a guitar or singing in public? Well, that, that seems... Not many. To, yeah, yeah. But Not that, that, many. That seems to... You know, we, I mean, because part of what we're talking about is sort of cultural relativity and, and, and should we... You know, it, when, when is it sort of... When is sort of censorship in the name of sort of cultural difference appropriate and when is it not and where do we draw the line and here you know this feels a little bit where, where you know when you're putting people in jail for that that's a little bit different than you know sort of saying that you're respecting you know Islam and it's you know you know I, historical tenets. You, you well yes and I although I do think you have to always separate big ideological systems Islam, Christianity, Judaism, America, Iran, um, from the smaller environments that exist within those larger, you know, exist within those larger um, institutional frameworks. So that when, when you look at, um, what, Albrecht, this one a lot of you might know, um, Albrecht Durer's great 1504 um, etching of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, where Eve is handing Adam the apple. He's there. He's thinking about what to do. And the narrative moment that the artist captures is the moment before the fall, right at the time when Adam is going to make the decision to, to disobey God's commandment. That means Adam and Eve are still perfect, they're pure, they don't know anything about sexuality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, Durer has been very careful 
to cover quite fortuitously um, Eve's breast. Well, he does that by appropriating the, the Venus of Praxiteles for her mm -hmm. basic pose. Um, and Adam's genitals are also covered. How come? Not from, for them, but to benefit the people that, that in his day, in Durer's day, will be looking at the engraving. Right. People yeah, who mm -hmm. are already fallen. Right. And the whole thing is, it gets to mm -hmm. be very, gets to be very complicated. And right. you know, yes, it's true. In, in Iran, you can get in trouble for doing stuff that over here would seem unbelievably dumb. Mm. Putting on fingernail polish. Right. If it's, the, if it's the wrong color. Eyeliner, yeah, lipstick, right. I, I, pulling I, I, your hijab yeah. back, wear, wearing yeah. bad hijab, I guess is what they call it. Is it, is it true that I, I, I heard that they actually pulled the fingernails uh, they, out? That has, <laughs> been hap that has been happening. I mean, that has happened, but it is not a... Because they have, uh, they have it the, is the not fashion a, guards. Yeah, it is not a prescribed penalty. Well, that's okay. You that's can because you can always <laughs> draw, you can always draw your way about yeah. out of almost anything. Yeah. And those people, the the morality police, right? The morality are police, actually right. the government finds it very difficult to control them as well. They're kind of a para. Mm. Morality mm. force, if you can ima imagine, you know, pick ten of you to wander around campus tomorrow and say your skirt's too short, your hair's mm. not the right length. I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, I, 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 I'd like to bring Francis back into this. This whole question of morality did that come up in terms of, of Duchamp and the, you know, the uh, um, you know kind of outrage over the Armory show? I mean, was it was it a question of morality? I suppose, but no one came out and said it. They, yeah. because publicly, they were just challenging the fact that they couldn't find the nude in the nude. Yeah, so it wasn't. That, they didn't. No. So it, that was not because an I, issue. It, we are basically a deeply puritanical society, mm -hmm. uh, which means we don't talk about those things. Right. So it, it they, yeah. It, so it may have been there, but it wasn't. It wasn't yeah. overtly stated, which is is somewhat different. Well, I w sure. I would just would like to you know because we unfortunately don't have a huge amount of time, but I would love to um, open it up to the audience at this point, and um, I think that there are some um, mics that are going around. So wait until you get a mic. Turn the lights um, on. And maybe turn we could yeah off. maybe we could turn, turn, turn yeah so we can actually see what's going on back there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, we'll start in the back. Yes. Question is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 My question has to do with um, the friendship between the deep alliance between iconoclasts and censors and the artist, to the extent to which the iconoclasts understand that images have power. Hmm. There's a kind of mad, beautiful power that that they are afraid of and that obviously needs to be destroyed, and that's a gift to artists. Mm. And I'm wondering if maybe you could talk about that. There's a, there is a strange and beautiful togetherness there, yes. Um, without, because without the idea that an image can have power, there is no reason to destroy it. And that was true for Protestant iconoclasts in the 16th century in Germany, um, as true as it is for the, for the people who um, were responsible for originally deciding that images like this needed to be censored. And and yes. and and to go back to the um, yeah the, the culture war of the '90s. I mean that was also in a way it, it showed the power of art. And I and I think that one of the things that's happened is that you know we we have this new culture war now, and and yet artists are not in the center of it anymore. And and what the 
you know, culture warriors of the 90s really did was to empower art in a, in a very important way. And I think that, you know, artists were dealing with a lot of issues of, you know, a lot of it actually had to do with the body and with AIDS and homophobia and, and misogyny. And, and they, you know, they, they got those issues out there. So you're right, it's kind of, in some ways it can almost be a gift to the artists to have, you know, this, this kind of, of censors coming around and, and um, you know, pushing, you know, something to push against. And it has to make the artists much more creative yeah. in their approach to it, which is how I, why I admire so many of these Iranian artists, that they have devised ways, and you'll see it in the book, really interesting ways of, um, of expressing their work. I, I mean, coming yeah. from the can I, can I just yeah, just, yeah, yeah, just quick. Yeah. Coming from the Western tradition. Oh, oh recording, recording right. Sound. Sorry. Um, coming from the Western tradition, um, you know, I have to say that that I love I love the body um, because that's what my entire artistic tradition is based around. Um, and <laughs> there, I got it. There we go. Okay, I'm, I'm good. I have enough trouble doing my I'm, own. I'm good. Um, um, and it's and it is a thing that carries enormous amounts of potential for all kinds of things, both as it's as it is alive as it is when it's represented, as it is when it's clothed, when it's nude, when it's male, when it's female, when it's transgressive, when it's perfect, when it's in the image and the likeness of God, etc. I mean, it really is a nexus where, where an enormous amount of power Hmm. is deployed. Right, no, the body, yeah, it, it's true. And clearly in other cultures, but in coming in different, different ways. In very in different, different ways. ways. But let's, yeah. Let's, yeah. You know, I'm interested in this whole idea of censorship and power or agency, and I was struck, Francis, with, because um, I'd never thought of it before, that Duchamp's descending nude was considered transgressive because she had agency. I mean, you didn't quite put it like that, but she was walking. She wasn't reclining. Um, and I wonder if you think that Duchamp's urinal showed men as vulnerable. Hmm. So, in fact, that's why that was offensive. I don't know that it showed men as vulnerable. It's, uh, it, it, it's hard to get a real handle on the read at the time because, you know, so very few people actually saw that object when it was presented to the independents. It disappeared shortly thereafter. It might have been smashed, uh, but there was the famous photograph taken of it, which made... But I'm not sure... It, it's hard to think of it that way. I, I think it's a case of... Just like Duchamp threw the urinal in the face of the public and people never thought about it as an art object, he put it into a different context. And in a way, this, we are, our Western images are going into a different context. It's a cultural divide that can't catch mm -hmm. up. And somehow I have in the back of my mind that eventually they will. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure of that. Maybe not. I mean, there are always extremes in every single culture that will never accept it no matter what you do. But I have this belief, maybe inappropriate right now, that eventually that will change. Even within Islam, it will change. Mm. Because of the artists who are chipping away at it from different angles, and maybe over time you chip away from it too, so that, you know, looking at a nude figure in public as late as 150 years ago was mm. uh, with, with Manet. That was, it was a scandal yeah, sure. at mm -hmm. the time when they showed it. So, you know, we've, we've evolved. But will they evolve? Mm. That I'm not sure of, but, and I think it'll take a longer time. Maybe I won't be here to see it, but. Well, there's a, I mean, there's a quote in the book where the guy, where one of, the, one of the Iranian artists that we talked to said, look, we have a problem in Iran. We've never had a renaissance. We've never had something to push back against like this. You guys had the enlightenment. We missed all that stuff, and now, you come around and say, be us next week. Yeah. Get a life. Mm. You know, it's not going to happen. 
But do you okay, think it will yeah. happen? Uh, he, does. Okay. he does. He does. Okay. He does. He does. We have, we have more questions here we'd like that to get to. Yeah. First of all, I, I think it's interesting that this artwork is being brought in, in books which I assume are intended to be educational. Exactly. At all. Mm -hmm. I, th I think yeah. because they, the government is strong enough. I mean, they certainly do plenty of censorship of other subject matter. They could say, we don't, we don't want books about Western art. But this is a very fundamental question. My core understanding of Islamic art was that it didn't represent the human body in any, because that was a form of idolatry, and that's why we see mostly geometric and floral, and you know, when, when you go into those countries, you don't see uh, yeah, portraiture, you don't see uh, images of, of uh, Mohammed, I mean, for example. The answer to that no. is yes and no. Um, there is not an Islamic prohibition of, against the representation of the human body that corresponds to the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me, no graven images, etc. Right, right, right. Although ISIS will tell you that there certainly is. Um, if look at Mughal painting, North, yeah, Persian mm -hmm. miniatures, North Indian painting, it's full not only of people, but of people having sex, of people doing all kinds of amazing stuff. These, these guys are all Islamic <laughs> who, are, who are commissioning these sorts of works. Um, on the other hand, it is considered to be absolutely unacceptable to, in almost every single context, represent Prophet Muhammad or Allah. There's none of this old guy with a beard business, mm -hmm. right? This is why if you go to the Dome of the Rock, you will see some of the greatest calligraphy you've ever seen all around everywhere. And these, think of, go to Isfahan and look at the domes of the mosques there, the amazing um, work that you see there that's totally non-representational, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it's a, it, there, there's, there, is a, there is a balance, and within, within secular Iranian art today, you can see, um, you can represent, under certain kinds of strictures, the human body at, in, in ways that, that will produce works of art that you could not tell from works that were produced in the West. Mm -hmm. Right, you go to Saudi Arabia. It's a way different story. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's not a monolith. I mean, I think that's the other kind of important thing to remember. Do we have another question here somewhere? Um, yeah. Just uh, um, <clears throat> going back to the the fox sensorizing. Yeah. Um, does anybody remember the two statues, the Art Deco statues, covered during the George W.'s first? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and also sure. Guernica, well, they covered Guernica, but also, no, but there were also, there, there they were, were two, two statues in of, the of Congress, justice. They were, and they were beautiful art deco. Right, yeah, they, had, they were, um, I think, naked, or they were yeah. breasts, it was like breasts were covered, yeah. There was yeah. one, yeah, going Right, right. And I, I hope they're... Ashcroft, yeah, oh. yeah. It was Ashcroft. Oh, my God, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, it's a kind of interesting parallel kind of situation and, and again as you know we sort of we look at these books and we think oh you know you know they you know we're, we're so much more advanced but you but know are, are we going backwards because they were they were <laughs> created in the 20s I think right the, obviously the art deco period right right well we're certainly going backwards right now <laughs> yeah, okay well, when, then we get into the Trump, Trump world. Yeah, I don't know if know, we want to, yeah. Uh, get, get into politics, but um, there so, certainly isn't the support of the arts and freedom that we had right. in the so past. So your conversation is um, making me think of times in our history, or in, in uh, Italy's history, when we were starting to talk about the Renaissance. And then I can't remember the name of that, um, priest was it Sa Sa Santorini? Sa Sa Savonola. Savonola. And Savonarola. He, Savonarola. Savonarola. And he completely. I mean, Italy seemed to be so enlightened, and all of a sudden, within a hundred, you know, fifty years, twenty years, everything was just like tanked. In Florence, and he got burned at the stake. 
But it's, I mean, that's true. But I'm just saying that it, at times, I mean, it's like we are coming and going in our own culture, and it's like it, we, we do this oh, every day. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And absolutely. I think that your comment, um, I think going back to, um, I guess I was, I was thinking how interesting it is that, I guess I'm losing my train of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> At any rate, um, but I guess I want to, wonder about at this point. I mean, I know that this is happening in Iran, and, and I was thinking about the Duchamp thing and how it was offensive, and I'm wondering if it was offensive because it was not addressing necessarily nudity, but it was addressing bodily functions that kind of we associate with dirtiness or something in different mm -hmm. cultures. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if in a way that's actually what people could have been more offend offended by. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that's a question for, for you, um, Francis, because I know that you're the Duchamp person. No. Well, but I think the, the immediate outrage for that was because it is a uniquely male artifact. Most women were supposed to have not by then seen a urinal anyway. Uh, they weren't really in shop windows. You could go into certain shops and see them. Uh, but you, you know, it's men basically trying to protect the woman's gaze on those objects. It was and, called fountain, and, right? Yeah. It was yeah. Fountain. yeah. 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 Fountain. yeah. Bernini instantaneously. Wow, you're warped. That's what, that's what, that's, you know, then I say, oh, I get it why they were upset. No, yeah, of course. Right, you know, sure. I th when I think of fountain, I think of these things that we see in the middle yeah. of every city, you know, they celebrate great military victories, yeah. all this kind of stuff, you know, the four continents of the world and so on. And here we got a piece of plumbing yeah. In, in, in which the fountain effect is provided by a yep. male function <laughs> that most people would not like to yeah. talk about in, in public, right? Yellow water. Okay, so I have one more point then. Isn't it almost always so that it's the males trying to keep the females yeah, well, from seeing what they don't want sure. them to see? I mean, it's happened over and over again. But as Eleanor brought up earlier, there were also women during the feminist movement right. that were against any display right. of, 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 of female of, bodies, of, of female body, or using the female body right. to any kind of advantage, right. so um, it, or yeah. pornography. I mean, they wanted to, to destroy all pornography. On the other yeah. hand, there were plenty of women who wanted plenty of lesbian pornography. Yep. Because, well, that's, well, again, because they were celebrating the, the female body, yeah. and the same thing is, is happening in Iranian feminism today, where there is a group of women who are almost entirely secular. They're either non-practicing Muslims or they have renounced Islam. Um, and they claim that it's not possible to be a practicing Muslim and be a feminist. Because if you're a practicing Muslim, you wear the hijab, you might have to wear a chador, you have to do these other things. And so that means that you cannot possibly, regardless of what you say, your choice in the matter is really, honest to God, have control of your body. But there are... And they're still fighting. Yeah. But, there are still Muslim, fighting but there are Muslim feminists as well. Oh, yeah. sure. So, there are women yeah. exactly on the other right, side right. of so, that. Yeah. And I know okay. some who right. would yeah. argue very vociferously right. that okay. that's a... I think we should have one more question. 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 There are people here who will tell you that I have something to do with that. This challenge is between the power of the word and the power of visual arts, which is why the great mosques do not have images, they have words. The power of the word controls far more than the power of visual arts. When you get those words repeated over and over and over again in prayers mm -hmm. from the time you're three years old and you understand that somewhere your lineage, great-grandparents, it goes on for 1,700 years. You are being indoctrinated with words. No one in that religion who has the desire for power and to maintain power wants visual images to challenge those words. Hmm. In that case, 
what Pam has done has challenged not only the visual artists, but challenged the words of all of the imams who have said words before image. But of course the words come before the image because, uh, well, if you're one of those guys that wears the black turban that lets everyone know that you can trace your lineage back to Prophet Muhammad, you can trace your lineage back to somebody who literally heard God speak to him hmm. and recited what he had and what recited what he had heard. And in that case, why would you want to have in the cave, the Gabriel? Gabriel. All he spoke to one person. You should call in that woman. She had her hand. Oh, oh, one more. Okay, okay, we'll do one more. Else was right. Okay. And that's where the challenge comes between all of the issues. The issues are: is the hearsay, the actual word Gabriel, not God, the angel Gabriel, representing God in his own distorted view of good and evil to get the tribes to come together to go to war? That's what this is all about. Okay, so in that case, okay, okay. the whole thing I, is a political I, ideology from I the get-go. We're getting a little far from our subject I here. And, I, 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 and, and let's get one more question right here. Yeah, her. This woman up here. Two more. She okay. had her hand up two first. Okay. Uh, no, the okay. woman here. Has okay. Here. Oh, okay. We have two more. All right. I want to know how you um, confront the issue of that, the fact that you are predominantly white, and you are male, and, and you are female as well, and I highly doubt that you have experienced living in Iran and experienced the culture. So I want to know how you, you describe these things and why you say the things you sort of say, and I find it very problematic that a white man and a white woman is speaking on behalf of a culture, and there is no Iranian present here speaking on this subject. Uh, in, in, in what way? Is it possible for me, for example, to speak on behalf of a 5th century BC white Athenian sculptor? No way. I've never lived in Athens in the 5th century BC. That culture is totally alien to me. If I am restricted in what I say to what I am, then I don't want to say any, why should I bother? But you know, if you can't say anything except what it is that you have experienced because of your ethnic and cultural background, but you're not I, who, who, I, I don't know. But you're not framing this why on, did, why on your should identity. I, you're not framing this on your background. You're saying this on behalf of these people. I, as, it, as it happens, I have had plenty of people who have lived in Iran who are Iranian, who have experienced these things, read the manuscript, and I have talked to them about those places where they felt that my argument reflected a bias that came from my Western orientalizing, um, uh, you know, whatever, tradition, and we worked through that bit by bit. That's the best I can do. That's, and, honest and, and to God, for, that's the, the best I can do. And for me as a woman, um, as I said in the beginning, I'm not Iranian. I mean, all I could do was empathize with the work, report it as clearly as I could. Um, yes, I got a little off track as I got angry about what I was having to do, but I did try to approach it in an ethical way. And I think we, you know, a lot of stuff is going on in this country. Dana Schutz was criticized for, you know, painting this painting about Emmett Till. Sam Durant was criticized by putting up the scaffolding from Native Americans that the kids were going to be playing on. And there, there was definitely uh, insensitivity in some of this. But for Dana, I mean, she's a mother. She's approaching it from a, a woman's point of view. But I, I, I don't think we should pigeonhole ourselves and not being able to talk about different cultures because then we're never going to make any progress. And as Francis says, hopefully we are going to make progress. Right. I, yeah. Can I just say one last final thing? I, I probably owe you an apology. So I apologize if I um, sounded a little defensive. Um, but um, I really do think that in order for there to be cultural dialogue and cultural production, 
that is valuable and useful, people have to be willing to speak across cultures. And, and if you want to look at it this way, to take chances in saying things about cultures which are not um, theirs by originary experience. And I am certainly very willing to have Iranian folks come to me and say, okay, I read this and I I think you're way off base here. And I will be more than happy to, to try to work that through with them. And I think um, it'll... I'm, you know, I was just being, I was being a little defensive and I do apologize for that. But I honestly think that you need to have that kind of dialogue in order to be able to get from here to over there. Does that make sense? And, 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 I, and I just, I'm sorry, I'll really just interject a little bit. I know that um, the, Carrie Patterson, the publisher, was very sensitive to these issues. Um, the book was submitted, the manuscripts were submitted to a number of Iranian artists and women, and um, the book really took a lot longer than was expected because a lot of changes yeah. were affected. Um, because yes. we, we don't understand their culture. I mean, yeah. things that we think are nothing, you know, to them is, is, is very big. So I think um, it is a delicate issue, for sure. Not surprisingly, I mean, not... But there was a lot of uh, Not surprisingly, there okay. are also differences of opinion among Iranians about it. Yeah. Okay, we're going we're gonna to do... A, we'll do one more. Okay, go ahead. I don't... I, you know, it took so long to get to me that I think that what I'm going to say is sort of somewhere about 10 minutes ago. Okay. So being that we're winding up here, maybe I'll just leave a couple of thoughts. Um, so one of the things that I thought might be interesting to talk about or think about in terms of nudity and culture is the public-private notions of nudity. Um, and what, when it popped into my mind, it was when you were talking about how you put three feminists in a room and they may not agree on anything, right? And I sort of took that in that moment and applied it across, across the whole conversation, right? So uh, in terms of what you were saying, how, you know, you, you can't just sort of, one can't say, well, all Muslim art is non-representational because of what is happening in one, you know, that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interpretation of whatever Muslim construct that, that you are living under. So um, in, in the hope of tolerance in this moment that we're living in, um, I think a lot of it, uh, there needs to be a slightly more granular conversation when we're talking to each other, uh, you know, defining, you know, what kind of Muslim practice do you do? Um, I, I personally, I'm, I'm an English Jew, which is people say, oh, do they even exist over there? Which is funny, right? Because of course we do. We're all over the world. But, you know, my, uh, you know I, I carry it around in my spirit. My husband is a Jew from Brooklyn who's an atheist, right? We're still Jews. So, you know, it's the same, it's, it, that construct can be applied across religion and I feel like it can be applied uh, across, uh, you know, nudity and how public or private you feel about your nudity individually, but also as a nation and also as a culture and also as a religion. Mm -hmm. So that's my five cents. I hope okay. it's helpful. It isn't okay. a question. But there we go. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Okay. 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 Oh. How about as a response? Okay. Right. okay. I, we have one other very <laughs> eager person. So let's do let's do you, and then and then we will close. Yes. I don't know that I followed everything that was talked about. It seems like there are many threads in this evening's dialogue. Thanks. But I do know that I am an artist, and I do know that I am living in a time of regime change in the country in which I live in. And what I know, the little bit that I know, is that when regime change happens in a way that is power driven, and I believe that is what's happening in our country right now, artists are always 
at the top of the target list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So every day when I hear people chattering about whatever they're chattering about, I don't hear the conversation elevated to the bigger picture of human rights and our future survival. All of these little nitpicking issues that have been gone over with a chicken's foot forever are behind us. We're facing a future we have never faced as human beings, ever. And the conversation has to change. It has to shift. It has to go somewhere where we're better protected in our ideas, in our thinking, in our behavior with each other, in our communication with one another, so that whatever we create is an expression of our will to continue the journey forward and survive. All right, and that seems like an excellent Wait, place to be. Wait, can I say one thing? Oh, okay, yeah. One of my teachers called Duchamp's urinal the invisible penis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, so thank you all for coming. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let's see if Sean's there. Thank you so much, Eleanor and Pam and Glenn and Francis. Oh, well, thank so you. I can do the one who gets in trouble this time. Oh, you